We are here with you and excited to continue in our study on the Christian Shema. This is the second lesson. And again, I've never presented these series of lessons to anyone. So hopefully you guys feel special. But I want to send my thanksgiving again for allowing you guys to have me, um, to share the word of God with you once again. And hopefully something will be said um, that will cause you to become a better child of God and to have you put on that heart of compassion towards the world and towards one another. Um, but we're gonna discuss the Christian Shema. This is the second lesson in our series of lessons. And this morning we're gonna talk about the perversion of the second greatest commandment, the perversion of the second greatest commandment. When we talk about the Shema, as I was saying earlier before I got kicked off, uh, the word there is the Hebrew word uh, that means to listen or to pay attention or to obey. Uh, we're gonna come back to this in our future lesson, one of our future lessons, and we're gonna go into great detail on talking about just that one Hebrew word, Shema, and then looking at the Septuagint Bible, how it uses the Greek word akue, uh, which means to hear, and we'll go into great detail there. But when we talk about the Shema to the Jew, it's very important to the Jew. Um, one, Jewish person said it this way, that the Shema is most central or is the most central prayer in Judaism. Um, it's a part of their morning and evening prayer. So every time the Jew says their prayer, they say Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four and five. And of course, not in English, but they say it in Hebrew. Uh, they say the Shema. So we know the verse in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. This is a part of the greatest commandments that Jesus gave during his personal ministry. And we know Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Yahweh, is our God. Yahweh is one. So there is but one God, and that one God is Yahweh. And we'll talk about how the person of the Godhead, or all three persons of the Godhead, take up that divine name, Yahweh, in a future lesson. In verse 5, it says, and you shall love the Lord or Yahweh, this one true God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, that's the Jewish prayer. That's just, this is what they say in the beginning of their prayers before they go into great detail in praying to Yahweh or the Lord. This is the Jewish prayer. Now, for us as Christians, as we talk about the Christian Shema, it goes a little bit deeper than just saying the prayer. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall, have, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. For us as Christians, it's more than a prayer. It's a lifestyle. It's our lifestyle. And as we look at the Christian Shema, we look at the Shema in this way. The Shema is much broader than just loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The Christian Shema also includes loving our neighbor because this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Remember when he was questioned by one of the experts in the law, he responds to this expert in the law when he asks him, what commandment is the foremost of all or what commandment is the greatest of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, here's, here's the greatest commandments in the whole entire scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. And of course, when, when Jesus made the statement, there wasn't a New Testament. But when the whole Bible is compiled, all the New Testament, this is still the greatest commandments of all. The foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 and verse 4, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, and see that that's the Jewish Shema. They would stop there in their prayers. But for us, we continue that prayer and we apply this to our lives as a lifestyle. The second is this, or the second is like it, because you cannot love God without loving fellow man. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, there is no other commandment greater than these. And so the greatest commandments, brethren, we need to pay attention here, is to have one God, and that one God is Yahweh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And we are to love that one true God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And we are to love ourselves. And then as we love ourselves, we love our neighbor the same way. If we don't love ourselves, if we don't treat ourselves properly, recognizing that we're made in the image of God and having this confidence in ourselves that we are servants of God and we're here on this earth to serve God, we're going to treat fellow man the same way. And so that's the Christian Shema. It's a lifestyle to love God first and to love ourselves and to love our neighbor. Now let's continue on in our discussion this morning because we're, we're talking about the perversion of the second greatest commandment. You know, you can make the Bible say anything that you want when not looking at passages in their entire context, when pulling verses out of context, coming up with the pretext or isolating verses. We can make the Bible say anything that we want. Let me give you an example here. I could say the Bible teaches there is no God because in Psalm 14 and verse 1, the Bible says there is no God. And so, since there is no God, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Because that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32. Notice how I pulled two passages out of context. Psalm 14 and verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And when Paul makes that statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32, he's talking about if there is no resurrection. If there is no hope for the Christian, then let us just live our life because we're going to die and we're going to be like the rest of the world. We're just going to be fertilizer for the next generation. We can also say the Bible teaches to go and commit suicide or the Bible teaches to go and kill yourself because Ahithophel strangled himself. You can say the same thing about Judas, that Judas hung himself. But Ahithophel strangled himself in 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 23. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Luke chapter 10 and verse 37. Ripping passages out of their context. We can make the Bible say anything that we want to. You can make the Bible say or the Bible teach that you are to hate your enemies and to go and destroy them. Matthew 5 and verse 43 and 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 3. Notice that these are two passages ripped out of context. Matthew 5 and verse 43 is what the leaders were saying. And Jesus clarifies that the, the religious leaders were wrong. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 3, that's God speaking to his people to go and destroy the Amalekites through Saul. And so, brethren, when we don't look at things in their context, we can ramble off at the mouth and say the Bible teaches this or the Bible says that and give a bunch of scriptures. But if we don't look at things contextually, we can make the Bible say whatever we want. How many of us have ever had a study with somebody and you try to show them the truth? It could be on the topic of baptism. It can be on the topic of the one true church that you find in the Bible. It could be on the worship of the one true church and people will take one passage and just isolate it by itself. Or people will take one passage and take it out of context. But brethren, we must always look at a Bible passage by the entire context of a book or, or by the entire context of the Bible. And so brethren, we must pay attention that people can make the Bible say whatever they want. And the point is that the religious leaders in Jesus' time the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, the Sadducees, they created loopholes with certain commandments of God. They looked at the scriptures and they came up with loopholes and ripped things out of context and came up with their own traditions. And so when Jesus rebukes the religious leaders, he rebukes them majority of the time for their traditions. Remember in Mark chapter 7, when the leaders there were upset with Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands. And the leaders thought that Jesus' disciples were sinners because they thought that it was, well, they didn't think, they were teaching that it was a sin. You would be spiritually unclean in the eyes of God if you didn't wash your hands before you ate your food. And so they tried to rebuke Jesus, but Jesus turns the tables on them and Jesus rebukes them. And here's what he says. For Moses said, Here, here's what the law really said. And you guys don't obey this law. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. 
And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. That's what the law said. The law said that a person, male or female, under the law was to respect their parents. And if they didn't respect their parents, they were to be put to death. That's what God said under the old law. But look at verse 11. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, anything of mine, you might have, uh, you might have been helped by is what? Korban, the Korban rule. That is to say, given to God. In other words, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time were teaching the people, look, yeah, the law says honor your father or your mother. And when they need help, here's what you ought to say to them. Well, I want to help you, mom and dad, but I just can't help you because my money is tied up. My money is tied up to the temple. My money is tied up in my service to God. But what did God really say? Honor your father and your mother. There's no loopholes. Yes, God knows that your money might be tied up for his service, but more importantly, respect your parents. They're the ones who brought you up. They're the ones who took care of you, and they're the ones who taught you the law. You take care of it. Now look at verse 12. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, twisting the word of God, twisting the law. And look at verse 13, thus invalidating the word of God, how? By your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. They handed down these traditions. They, they watered down the word of God. They came up with these loopholes when it came to the word of God. And Jesus says, look, you guys are hypocrites. You guys rather keep your tradition rather than listening to what God said. You're trying to scold my disciples for not washing their hands before they eat. The law never said anything about that. As far as a person uh, washing his hands to be spiritually clean. Law never said anything like that. And Jesus says, look, you guys hold on to your tradition so much. You come up with loopholes. You don't even keep the simplest commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And there's no excuses. Can you imagine if we did that today? Your parents are in need of help. And you say, well, I just can't help you, mom and dad. I know that you're older now and you're getting kind of sick. But my money is devoted to God. And I need to use my money to give it on Sunday. And my money is devoted to buy Bibles and to help other people out. I just can't help you, mom and dad. That's not logical, is it? God wants us to respect and honor our mother and our father. And that's still taught in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. Even though we're adults, we still honor our mother and our fathers. They're the ones who brought us into this world. They're the ones who took care of us. And now it's our turn to take care of them. That's a separate lesson in itself. <laughs> they perverted the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They perverted what it truly meant to love your neighbor as yourself. Here's how they interpreted the law. Here's what they said the law meant. Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, correcting them, said, you have heard it was said. Notice they said, you have heard it was said. He didn't say that you have read what it is said, or this is what the law says. No, this is what the leaders were saying. They, they quoted part of a verse, but then flipped it. Here's what they said. You shall love your neighbor. Yeah, that's good. The law says love your neighbor, and that's what God wants you to do. Love your neighbor. But guess what? Go ahead and hate your enemy. Go ahead and hate your enemy and hate your enemy. Because the law just says love your neighbor, and your neighbor is the one you love. And the neighbor is the one who you get along with. Your neighbor is not your enemy, so go ahead and hate him. That's what they taught. But that's not what the scriptures actually taught. Notice something here on my slide. What the scriptures truly taught on loving your enemy or loving your neighbor. This is from the Old Testament too, by the way. This is from the Old Testament. This is what God commanded his people to love their neighbor and their neighbor included their enemy. But the religious leaders twisted that and came up with loopholes and said, yeah, my neighbor is just the one I get along with and I can love them, but I can hate my enemy and call down fire from heaven to, to consume them, or I can pray these imprecatory psalms uh, so that they can be destroyed by God. 
Notice that in Matthew 5 and verse 43 is a partial quotation of Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. It's a partial quotation because they partially quoted Leviticus 19 and 18 and they flipped it and they made it say whatever they wanted. Coming up with that loophole, loophole let me read Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Because when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, this is a quotation from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And here's what it says. You shall not take vengeance. Notice that. <laughs> you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. Look, if somebody does you wrong, you don't take vengeance in your own hands. There's a court system for that under the old law. And not only that, God will take care of the matter. And then look at what he says. But you shall love your neighbor how? As yourself. I am Yahweh, or I am the Lord, the one true God. Don't take vengeance in your own hands. Don't hate your enemy. You say, well, Brother John, that's not what it says. Well, skip down to verses 33 to 34, and we can get a commentary on what the law is saying. 33 to 34. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him what? Wrong. So you have a stranger living with you. Well, he's not a part of the people I love, or he's not a part of Israel. So I'm going to go ahead and treat him wrong. And God says, don't do that. Don't treat him wrong. Don't treat the stranger wrong. Look at verse 34. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him, how? As yourself. For you are aliens in the land of Egypt, and I am Yahweh, your God. How did Pharaoh treat the people of Israel? Or how did Pharaoh treat the Hebrews? Well, he enslaved them. They were strangers. They were a threat to him. And so he enslaved them and he treated them wrong. And God is saying, look, when you have a foreigner living among you, don't treat him as an enemy. Love him as yourself and let him live among you. Let him know who God is and let him become a proselyte. Take care of him. Look at Exodus chapter 23 on the topic of the enemy. Exodus 23. Now, we're looking at the Old Testament because we're talking about what the law truly said, what the Old Covenant truly said on loving your neighbor and loving your enemy. Look at this. If you meet your enemy's ox, notice that your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely what? Return it to him. What? You know, if your enemy's donkey wanders away, what's the natural thing to do if you don't like somebody or they don't like you? Well, let that donkey go. You can care less about him, right? If you have a worldly attitude, if you're not listening to what God says, that's, that's what you're going to do. Ha ha, look at his donkey. It's wandering. That's what he gets. There's karma, right? That's how the world thinks. And look at verse five. But what does God say in verse four? Give it back to him. Return it to him. Love your enemy. Verse five, if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, in other words, it's laid, you know, it, it, its load is too heavy. Um, it's weighed down, this donkey. You shall refrain from leaving it to him. Just sit there weighed down with all this stuff on his back. He's unable to move. You shall surely release it with him. Help out your enemy. Help out your neighbor. Help him out. That's what the Bible says. The Bible, the old covenant, commanded God's people to even love their enemy. Look at these prophets. Um, and it talks about loving your enemy. Look at I believe these are some powerful words. Remember, when we read the Proverbs, they're words of wisdom. Words of wisdom to all people. And so they apply for all children of God for all ages. And, and here's what it says. When I mean all ages, I'm not talking about boys and girls. <laughs> children and adults and talking about through all generations, that they're words of wisdom for all people throughout every generation. Verse 17, it says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't be happy when your enemy falls, your enemy is defeated. Don't rejoice and say, ha ha, he's getting what he deserves. Karma is true. He's a wicked person and God is giving to him what he deserves. Watch this. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and he turn away his anger from him. 
Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Why? Because God is telling us to treat our enemies right. To pray for our enemies that they might see the truth. To pray for our enemies that they might change, that they might repent. And pray for our enemies, trusting in God that if they do not repent, they're going to answer to him. But we don't rejoice when our enemies fall. Because the scripture, the words of wisdom is telling us, look, if you do that, if you rejoice in that, God is going to change his mind concerning your enemy who fell. He's going to have compassion on him. Now turn over to chapter 25, Proverbs. Proverbs 25, beginning at verse 21. Words of wisdom again. This is the Old Testament. And notice something here that these words of wisdom are going to sound familiar to you. If we just read them, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord, Yahweh, will reward who? You, God will take care of you if you love your enemy. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sounds like you read that somewhere in the New Testament, right? Yes, because Paul is quoting from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22 in Romans 12 and verse 20. Romans 12 and verse 20, where Paul is telling us to love our enemies, to pray for our enemies. And if they are in need of food, give it to them. If they are in need of drink, give it to them. That's what the Proverbs say. We must love our enemies. We must help them out when they are in need and God will reward us. And notice that for you will heat burning coals on his head. His conscience will be burned by the good that you're doing to him. He or she will have to think about why in the world are you so good to them? Why is it that they're feeding me? Why is it that they're giving me something to drink when I am in need? That will bother them. And hopefully that will cause them to change, to repent, and hopefully that will cause them to become a child of God. Isn't that our prayer? Remember, before we became Christians, we were enemies of God, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5. And now we're in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And God wants all people to be saved, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. God wants all people to be saved, brethren. And we must understand that. Now here we're going to get into a great text in this next part of uh, next point that we want to make. That Jesus in Luke chapter 10 explains what it truly means to love your neighbor. And Jesus explains who is your neighbor. Remember, we talked about the religious leaders trying to come up with loopholes and trying to pervert what the law said. Yeah, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. We're going to learn some great lessons here in Luke chapter 10, dealing with the, we call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, we even have that terminology. Be a good Samaritan, help somebody out. Or people are covered by the good Samaritan law. If they find somebody passed out on the ground and they try to help them out, they cannot get sued. Why? Because they're covered by the good Samaritan law. Let's go to Luke chapter 10 this morning. And, and this will be our last main text that we look at. And we'll look at some other verses to shed light on what we've been talking about. But we're going to spend some time here in Luke chapter 10 beginning at verse 25. So turn your Bible over to Luke 10, beginning at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer, remember he's supposed to be an expert in the law, stood up and put him to the test. Notice that he's trying to test Jesus. He's trying to see whether he knows the law of God or not. And he wants to trap him, to outdo him and to embarrass him. Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now that's a great question, isn't it? It's the most important question anybody can ever ask. What shall I do in order to be saved? What shall I do in order to go to heaven? What shall I do in order to gain or inherit eternal life? You see, he's asking this question, but at the same time, he's trying to show Jesus up, this lawyer. In verse 26, and he said to him, this is Jesus responding to this expert. Remember how the experts twisted what it meant to love your neighbor. Keep that in context. Keep that in your mind. Jesus says, what is written in the law? What did God say on the matter? Notice that too. I like that. 
You know, if anybody, anybody asks you or ever asks you a question regarding a biblical topic, how do you respond? What does the Bible say? What does God say on the topic? Because that's what Jesus says. What is written in the law? What does God say on the topic? What does God say on the matter? And he says, how does it read to you? Now, Jesus is not saying, yeah, what does the law say? And how does it read to you? How do you understand it? You can interpret it any way you want. I've heard some people make that statement about this verse. That Jesus is saying, yeah, you can interpret the law any way you want. Remember in the beginning of our lesson what we talked about? You can make the Bible say anything if you rip things out of context. And if this lawyer didn't respond properly, Jesus would have corrected him. Jesus is saying, what does God say on the subject? And how do you understand what the scripture says on this subject? Not how do you understand it and how do you interpret it yourself? But what does the law actually say? Now look at this. Verse 27, and he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. He says the two greatest commandments. He quotes the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four and five. And then he concludes with Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, the two greatest commandments. Now watch this. And he said to him, Jesus responds to this lawyer. You have answered correctly. You see that? You, 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 you explain the scriptures, what the, scripture, what the scripture actually teaches on what you need to do to inherit eternal life and what you need to do in order to be saved. Love God and, and love fellow man and love yourself. And Jesus said, you said that correctly. If he would have said the wrong thing, trust me, Jesus would have corrected him. And then watch what Jesus said. Do this and you will what? Live. Remember what the man said? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He's talking to a Jew under the law and Jesus gives him the two greatest commandments. And Jesus says, look, apply this to your life and you will what? Live. Now look at verse 29. Because this is important here. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Remember we talked about how they interpreted what it meant, uh, who your neighbor was. Your neighbor is just the one you get along with. The neighbor is the one whom you like, but you can hate your enemies. And so he wants to justify himself by saying, look, well, who truly is my neighbor then? I, I, I want to see, you know, what you have to say on the matter. And I want to justify myself in regards to this topic. And, and Jesus is going to tell this parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think we can learn a lot from this parable. So Jesus is going to explain who truly is your neighbor. Now watch this. Jesus replied and said, a certain man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, I want to give you the next slide before I expound upon that verse. A certain man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. If you look at my slide up here, that's actually the road from Jerusalem to Jericho or from Jericho from Jerusalem. This is the road from Jerusalem, and you go down to Jericho. Notice how small that road is. And it's a 30-mile journey. 30-mile journey walking on that little road going all the way uh, from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, anybody can be hiding out there on that little road. Animals, as a matter of fact, there's goats that run around throughout that place. An animal can be waiting on you through there as well. A snake can be out there. Anything can be out there. And so when Jesus tells this parable, if we can call it that, the people would be familiar with this road. This 30-mile journey on foot from Jerusalem to Jericho in the heat. This long journey. And let's read the rest of this verse. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem. He fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and walked him. There's a man on this journey. He's going down that little road, this 30 mile journey. And there's robbers waiting on him. And when you study what people say about this area in biblical times, that this was a dangerous road because look how narrow it is. And not only that, 
there were people who would wait on you. You can't see if anybody's hiding behind a rock. There would be these robbers waiting on you. And they would watch you come by. And, and if you look like you had something, they will beat you with sticks and rods. That's what it means by he, uh, the, the, they beat him. They stripped him and beat him. They would beat you and take everything that you had, these robbers. A very dangerous area. And so we have this man going down this road, and he's attacked, he's beaten, and he's left half dead. Now look at this. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road. Now, your Bible, if you're reading the New American Standard, it says by chance. It sounds like it's an accident. But when you look this word up in a lexical source or various lexical sources, one of the lexical sources, I looked up the Greek word, uh, Korea, that's how you say it, Korea. One of my lexical sources, the help word study says that this word means properly what occurs together by God's providential arrangement of circumstances, according to divine coincidence. In other words, God is involved. It's by God's providence that this certain priest was going, in verse 31, was going down on that road. Priest is going down that little narrow road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. He went right around him. This is a priest. This is somebody who knows the law. What did the law say? Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. That's what the law said, and that's what they were to live by. And in verse 32, and likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Both people lived under the law, and both people were supposed to be experts under the law. And what did the law say? Love your neighbor as yourself. But instead, they see the man beaten, even left half dead. They just walk around him. They just leave him there. Now, some might say, well, the law said that the priests and, and the Levites were to stay away from dead bodies. Yeah, but the man wasn't dead. The Bible says he was half dead. We don't know if he was just laying there and didn't moan and groan. The text doesn't say. But these religious leaders should have helped the man out because they were to love their neighbor as their self. Now, I want you to look at verse 33 closely. But a certain Samaritan. Now, there's weight there in that verse. There's a point there being made in that verse. A certain Samaritan, we'll come back and talk. A certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. Now, this Samaritan is an enemy of the Jews. He's an enemy. They don't get along. They don't like each other. Remember, they were at odds with one another. There was tension between one another. Remember James and John in, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 54 wanted to call fire down from heaven to consume the Samaritans because they wouldn't let Jesus pass through Samaria going down to Jerusalem from Galilee. They were at odds with one. And remember what John says in John chapter 4 and verse 9 that Jews have no dealings with what? Samaritans. They were enemies. But this enemy, he stops and this enemy helps him out. That's Jesus' point here. The law said to love all people, love your neighbor, and love your enemies, take care of them. But a certain Samaritan, verse 33, who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. In the Greek there, it's very strong. Splog needs oh my. Splog needs oh my. It means to be moved from within that your inward parts are moved. Splagnizomai comes from the Greek word splagnon, which means spleen. He saw the man, he was moved from within. He had this compassion. He felt it within himself. He felt bad for the man. The man was half, halfway dead. He was beaten and nearly dead. He sees him and he has compassion upon him, even though he's an enemy. It came to him. Now look at this. And came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Had this compassion 
gives him bandage, he bandages him up, he pours his own oil and wine upon the man, and he puts him on his own animal. And he takes him to an inn and he pays for that. And then not only that, he stays in the inn and he takes care of him. Verse 35. And on the next day, he took out two denarii. He uses his own money to take care of this man. And gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, what? I will repay you. He has compassion for this man. He has compassion for his enemy. And he's willing to go the extra mile, so to speak, to help him out. Now, Jesus is going to teach this scribe, excuse me, this lawyer, a lesson. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? You want to know who your neighbor is? Which one behaved like the neighbor? Verse 37. And he said, that is the expert, the one who showed what? Mercy. It's a different Greek word there for mercy. It's a different Greek word than splagnizomai, filling it from within. It's the Greek word elias, compassion, mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and what? Do the same. You see that? Very beautiful, isn't it? Go and have compassion upon your enemies, Go and have compassion upon anyone who needs help. Only if the world can look at this parable, if you would call it that, or if this is a real incident, it's hard to tell by the text. But if people would read this, if Christians would read this and apply this in their life, the world would be a better place, right? But instead, what does the world do when they see people in danger or people being harmed in this day and time? They pull out their phones and they record everything. And then they put it on Facebook or they put it on YouTube and they get millions of views and people watch other people getting beaten or hurt and the whole world loves it because they rejoice in violence and wickedness. Instead of responding like this enemy this Samaritan in the parable, and helping somebody. Brethren, the world behaves one way, and we shouldn't behave that way. Jesus explains in this parable, who is our neighbor? Or who is your neighbor? It's interesting that the word, the Greek word for neighbor is the Greek word, uh, placeon, placeon. It means neighbor, friend, fellow man. And I like this definition because one time in the New Testament is translated as nearby. In John 4 and verse 5, it says near the parcel of ground. That's the same word for neighbor, or that word near there in John 4 and 5. Place on. Who is your neighbor? Anybody who's close by. Who is your neighbor? Eve, your enemy. Who is your neighbor? Your friend. Who is your neighbor? Fellow man. Anybody who is in need. That is your neighbor. Let's close the lesson with this. Love, brethren, is the greatest commandment. To love God first, to love ourselves, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And, and in with, within the definition of neighbor, our neighbor is even our enemies. And so love is the greatest commandment. You know, you think about love. I, I appreciate the song that Brother Kennedy sang uh, excuse me, not Kennedy. Uh, that was Pete. <laughs> uh, seeing those two on the screen. Thank you for that song, the song of love. Thank you for that. Thank you for that surprise. Love is the greatest commandment. If you want a good definition of love, the Greek word is agape. If you want to know what agape truly is, read First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and that will give you a good biblical definition of the word agape. But agape is a noun. The verb of agape is agapal, which is showing action, you showing your love for fellow man and for you showing your fellow love. I mean, showing your love for God, not fellow love. But agape and agapal, brethren, are used interchangeably in the scriptures with phileo. And you say, well, Brother Johns, I don't know about that because agape means unconditional love and phileo is the friendship type of love. True. 
But if you'll do a word study, especially throughout the Gospel of John and John's epistles and First John and throughout the New Testament, you'll see that agape and agapao, like I said, one's the noun, one's the verb, they're different forms of the word. And phileo are used interchangeably. And John 3 and verse 35 talks about the father loving the son. And John chapter 5 and verse 20 talks about the father loving the son. One uses the word agape, the other one uses the word phileo. They're used interchangeably throughout the New Testament. We must unconditionally love our neighbors. We must unconditionally love God. But we also must be friendly towards them. Think about that. Let's look at a few passages, and then the lesson is yours. I don't want to keep you too long. Thank you for your patience and kindness with me this morning, knowing that I've had some issues when it came to the Internet. But look what Paul says in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. He says, owe nothing to anyone. Don't owe, don't owe anybody anything, but here's what you ought to owe people. It's kind of funny. Except to love one another. Love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. How do you fulfill the law? Loving your neighbor. How do you fulfill the law? Loving God. Loving God will cause you to love your neighbor because that's what God wants you to do. In verse 9, for this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor how? As your so notice that as we look at these commandments in verse nine, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. These are commandments against fellow man. If we truly love God, we will truly love our brethren. We will love our enemies. We will love all people and we won't do any harm to anyone. And I like what he says in verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, their love, therefore, is the fulfillment of what? The law. Love will motivate you to do what God says. Look at James chapter 2 with me. James 2, beginning in verse 8. And we're just going to look at two verses. Uh, contextually, remember, he's talking about uh, the, the brethren there were showing favoritism. That a rich man comes in the assembly wearing the ring. They treat him with specialty. The poor man comes in. They treat him like dirt. And James says, look, you, you don't treat people that way. And James says, look. If you truly understand what love is, if you truly understand the royal law, the law of love, the law of Christ, you wouldn't treat anybody that way. You wouldn't be a respecter of a person. So here's this point, verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor how? As yourself. You are doing well. Now look at verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as what? Transgressors. If we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we're going to treat everybody the same, right? We're not going to be a respecter of persons. We're not going to treat the homeless visitor like dirt and treat the clean visitor uh, better. At our jobs, we should say hello to everybody from the person who takes out the trash, from the person who mops the floor to the CEO. We shouldn't be respecter of persons. Look at Matthew 7 and verse 12. Matthew 7 and verse 12. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is what? The law and the prophets. Treat everybody the same. You want people to treat you right? Treat them fair. They'll treat you fair. But that's not always the case, though. That's a general statement. Jesus also promised persecution. Jesus also promised that people would hate us for following after him. But how do we respond when people hate us? Help them out. Pray for our enemy. Feed them. Give them water if they need it. Go back to Matthew 5 and verse 43, and then we're going to close the lesson. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, but within that you can hate your enemy. Was that true? No. And Jesus corrected them on that. Here's Jesus' command. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who what? Persecute you in order that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, what's Jesus saying? God is good to all people. God takes care of all people. 
God wants all people to be saved, and God specifically takes care of his children. Yes, for sure. Amen. But God is good to all. And he says, look, if we pray for those who persecute us, if we treat them right, we're behaving like God. We're children of God. We're not a respecter of persons. We, we try to treat everybody fair. And he says, look at this. In verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. What's the point? Love everybody, treat everybody the same, pray for your enemies, do what's right, and let us be like God, because God loves all people. You know, it's easy for us to love people who we get along with. It's easy for us to pray for those whom we like. It's more of a challenge for us to love our enemies, and it's more of a challenge for us to pray for them. I hope that this lesson has pricked your heart. And I thank you for your undivided attention. If there's anybody here who needs a response to the gospel, please let that be known. And I thank you.